think was really the right place to look. The most important thing he discovered was how widely Sweden diverged from the history of other countries. It was a particular place. A lot of its particularities came from its peasant origins. You know, it had this tremendous tradition of egalitarian that we've been talking about. Uh, uh, but it didn't have much of a tradition of, um, of individual rights. That was a strange thing about it. Then there were other peculiarities that came from its homogeneity. And, and, and for instance, there was, a, um, there was a sense of shame in not working, in not carrying, you know, like your share of the load. And this homogeneity, Rojas also found, extended to opinion. You know, Swedes expected to agree with one another. Uh, you know, and, and, that, and that made its difference, its development very different from other Western European nations. A lot of European nations developed as a way of finding a compromise between clashing interests, you know, classes or, or, or noble houses or even nations. I mean, the United Kingdom is the classic example uh, uh, of that. But actually, Sweden didn't really have many competing interests. And as such, there were a whole, there were lots of things that were typical of the West that it didn't really have in quite the same way, like, um, uh, you know, freelance intellectuals, you know, an obsession for a, with a free press. I mean, Sweden, Sweden, both radio and television were state monopolies into the 1980s. It didn't have a Western idea of the separation of powers. I mean, because you don't, the goal was not arguing, the goal was sort of agreeing. And so Rojas looked at these things and he said, well, of, of course you can build socialism in a place like that, but most places aren't like that. And he asked people to try to understand how strange um, Swedish socialism was by asking them to look the, at sort of more normal, less controversial Swedish things. And he took the example of a piece of Swedish modern furniture, um, like a, a table. And I'll, 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 I'll close with, with, with the conclusion he drew from it. He said, he said the, the Swedes look at a table and they, they're so provincial that they think it's just a normal table. But, but Rojas, having grown up in Chile, could see actually how different the sw Swedish table was. And I will quote from an essay of his. He says, the fascinating austerity and naturalism of Nordic design, the Swedish passion for simplicity and the natural, the evident dislike of purely ornamental or ostentatious elements, the illegitimacy of luxury and a very sober relation to money, all these are expressions of a culture bearing the mark of a still unchallenged peasant heritage in which is deemed detestable not only aristocratic pomp or individualistic petty bourgeois swagger, but also any attempt to be noticeably different from the mass of the people or to act without some kind of collective cover. And I think with that, Rojas had, uh, had discovered the solution to the problem that we've spent the last half hour discussing. I mean, Swedish uh, socialism arose from peculiarities of Sweden's national character. Not only that, it relied on social and economic capital that had been built up before Sweden became socialist. And this was, this was not a program that could be replicated elsewhere, no matter how long one studied it. In fact, uh, it was not a program at all. It was a, it was a culture. Um, if you have that kind of culture, it will be, uh, it'll probably be pretty easy to build socialism. But if, if you don't, you'd probably be wiser not to try.